Welcome to the call, everyone. Uh, I'm chairing today mainly because Tim is in the office where Wi-Fi is awful. Uh, I'm at home where Wi-Fi is hopefully slightly better. Um, so, um, so yes, that's, so Tim is Tim is here, uh, but Tim is um, uh, yeah on, on the on the reserve power, I think. Um, whatever's going on back there. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, uh, welcome to the call. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of issues today that we've already sent round. Uh, customer authentication and wait lists uh, is the is the agenda in that order. Um, so if we could start with a quick uh, introduction from everyone here, just so we all know who else is on the call. Um, and um, maybe starting uh, with you, Anne-Marie, because you're on the phone and you can't see what else is going on. I literally was, I literally was trying to unmute for about seven attempts there. <laughs> so um, apologies, Anne-Marie Eric, Digital Lead for MCR Active, Manchester City Council. Super. Um, I'm just going to follow the order that's on my screen. Uh, so, uh, Eugene, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Eugene Minogue. I'm the Head of Physical Activity Leisure of Sport at Westminster City Council and responsible for the uh, Active Westminster Digital Programme. Brilliant. Uh, Guy? Yep, Guy Horton, uh, product owner at Gladstone um, and work quite a lot with everyone active in particular. Brilliant. Thanks, Guy. Uh, Jamie. Uh, hi, I'm Jamie, founder and CEO of Playfinder, and we're a marketplace that helps people find and book sports facilities online. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Gary, who's really Johnny? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, it's Gary. No, it's Johnny. Um, no idea why my team's logged in as Gary. Uh, from Sport 80, uh, we primarily deal with national governing bodies, providing technology to allow them to manage, um, amongst many things, memberships, event registrations, that kind of stuff. And uh, we'll be looking to roll out club management solutions, which should tie in nicely with what we're all talking about. So, thanks for watching. Excellent. Uh, L done. I've also got Alex Johansson with me, who's also QA, Mark Austin, who's the president of me, and Jason Moore, who's also in Gladstone. Good morning, Gladstone. Brilliant. It's a whole Gladstone party behind that one box. Yeah. It's like a game show. That's great. Um, Sorry, was it just me or was that quite hard to hear? It was. I, you guys might have to speak a little bit closer to the uh, the audio if you're um, when you're talking there. Is that any better? Uh, slightly better. A bit closer. How's that? Better. Okay. <laughs> um, so four people from Gladstone, I heard. Um, great, thanks, Louise. Um, Josh, Josh. Um, I'm Josh, a de developer with Playways. Uh, we've got Rupert in here as well. He's going to be our main voice. Uh, Rupert, do you want to go next then? That sounds like a segue into my introduction. Uh, yes, Rupert, I'm the CEO of Playways. Uh, for those that don't know us, we're a, a digital sports management platform, competition management, session management, etc. Um, with a broad range of clients, everything from clubs to active partnerships to national governing bodies. And we're, um, we're doing a lot of work in the open data space, specifically around the booking API at the moment. So hence why we're here. Great, thanks Rupert, that's brilliant. Um, Dave, is that you in the box? Yeah, hi, uh, Dave Pettit. I'm a IT Relationship Manager at Westminster City Council. I'm also working with Eugene at the moment implementing the Active Westminster um, digital platform. Fantastic. Uh, and uh, Wayne uh, just joined. Um, we did, I did say you were coming. <laughs> Are you able to do a quick intro? Yeah, I'm sorry I'm late. No worries. Um, so, Wayne Granger, I'm the product owner at Legend, um, and I'm here to, I guess, to get more involved now in, in, in this kind of thing. Uh, I'm starting to get my head around my, my new role here at Legend. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Welcome. Um, and uh, last but very much not least, uh, Tim. Uh, yeah, Tim Hill, um, normally chair of the meetings from the Open Data Institute, so helping to coordinate uh, Open Active and its technical standards. Uh, sorry, there's one more Nish. Your your box is your box is black on my screen. I didn't see you. Um, apologies. Uh, do you want to go as well? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Nick, how can you forget me? I know, um, right? <laughs> hi everyone. Uh, Nish here from my Um I think most people know what we do here, but yeah, we work with the various people on the call and elsewhere to 
to help them to utilize open data in their various products and services. Super, okay, excellent. Uh, thank you all for, for joining. Uh, apologies, Tim, if I just cut you off there um, with my excitement of realizing I've missed somebody. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk through these two issues. I'm gonna bring them up on the screen um, so that you can see them. Um, if you go to the agenda, uh, you can find the links in there uh, yourselves. Um, and uh, what we'll do is we'll just talk through uh, each of them. Um, and, and the plan is to talk through initially um, and then uh, at the point where uh, everyone's got a firm grasp of what's going on, then um, we can talk about the kind of issues that maybe um, they bring to light um, and uh, kind of go from there. So I'm going to just press this button and hopefully you can see everything. Can you see that? Yeah, that's good. Okie dokie, excellent. Um, so this is the customer authentication issue, complete with a visual, uh, which is here. Um, and so just to explain what this issue is about, um, this is about allowing people who are uh, already members of um, uh, GLL or Everyone Active or, or um, uh, whatever leisure operator, for example, if it's a leisure operator, um, to log in and make a booking, but through an experience like Change for Life or another um, a data user or broker. So the idea is that if you're usually going through the process of, of going to try and book something, you get to the point where it says, um, would you like to, um, it, it, would, it would say book here, book now, whatever, you click book and it says, would you like to be a guest? Or would you like to be logging in as a member? If you choose to log in as a member, you get presented with this hit box. Um, so does that make sense as far as the user journey goes? We're talking about the point where you choose to be a guest or you log in as a member, which is different because at the moment we just have the login as guest option. We don't have the member option. No cameras, so I'm just gonna have to go with silence as, as yes, that's great, it makes yep. sense. I'll just, just clarify something then, Nick. Um, so uh, the two options is, uh, 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 sorry, we've got some building work going on in our office actually. Um, so, uh, the two options are I'm, either coming in as a guest or I'm going to, I've all, I'm already a member of the target system and uh, will provide my credentials. Uh, is there not a third option where the target system requires somebody to become uh, a registered user on their target system? So, so there's guest, sign in and regis register. Register, join, absolutely right. That's, that's yeah. very true. Um, and, uh, and I, I suppose within this experience, you could feasibly have a join now button in the box, which I guess we can talk about. Um, but the, the focus of this is, um, rather than allowing the joining to happen automatically, this is just, a, this is the second of those that you, you talked about there. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, Nick, Nick, um, Dave, Dave here, just a question on this as well. Cause I mean, in, in this kind of user journey, you're talking about say, say with Westminster, that would be someone logging into their everyone access account I, I i think that's how you've described it there now everyone active yeah yeah so we would have the challenge at, at westminster where we're we're promoting our my westminster account which we use across multiple services um and which we we intend to kind of issue an active westminster discount card through that um now from our customer journey experience if this is coming from our website we would want that login to be logging into the my westminster account in mm -hmm. initially you know to, to get that consistency of user journeys so mm -hmm. that presents a potential challenge in terms of actually you're not connecting with the third party system that's providing the activity but actually there's some handshake that goes on with within this case westminster council yeah, so I, there, I guess there's a question about where the, the database lives. Obviously, I know a little bit about your, your setup. So in the case where the database lives in Everyone Active, um, then I guess there's a question about the branding of this green box. Does the branding say Everyone Active or does it say Westminster? Um, is, the, is the person that's signing up aware that they're a member of one or the other? Um, or, or either, maybe. Maybe it's co-branded. Um, because that, that's... Uh, I suppose it's, it's, it's what, what, what would they recognize the card details they're putting in? So on your, to your point, actually, um, Debbie, I've already uh, had a chat with Debbie from Everyone Active. 
uh, in detail before this call because she was unable to make it. And um, I've got another diagram which is closer to what your world looks like, uh, David, um, in terms of card ID and last name uh, in the same box um, and uh, with that same idea. So um, yeah, so I guess it's it's this is this is the mech the mechanism here is just allowing you to log into whatever the system is. Uh, and then I guess the branding is a good question because like you say, it's not necessarily system branding that you need there in that box. It's probably whatever the user recognizes their credentials as. So it won't be a Gladstone logo. It will probably be the operator's logo. And in the case where the operator has sub brands or brands alongside the, um, uh, the councils, potentially it's, it's branded even more. Um, yeah. I, I, I wonder if, I, I, I don't know, there may be a, a misunderstanding. So I, I, the branding is an element, but I think the key thing would be, you know, from a Westminster resident user journey, would, you know, if, if they if they had a card, if they got a card, would be getting them to sign into our, their My Westminster accounts, um, yeah, which we manage through Active Directory and, and Microsoft Dynamics. So that that would be their 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 ID is associated with Westminster, but actually the activity is. The activity is provided by everyone active, and this the expectation would be that they then have a handshake with everyone active rather than that. Now, potentially, we we can build those lookups and cross references outside of the system, and uh, and potentially carry those details across through a login process in advance of this. But there's, uh, yeah. I, I, do, do you understand the, the potential problem we have? There? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it's a, yeah. Okay. I can, I think it might be easy to, to draw that out as a, as a, um, pro probably book about how, that, how that looks. Um, let's, yeah. let's, well, so we, could we, could we park that for a second? Oh, I mean, would, yeah, would this actually, I mean, if it would help, um, it might help, uh, I guess you to engage in the discussion, but other people as well to understand what this is talking about a little bit. So, I tell you what, let's let's take a let's just take a five minute detour, and what I'll do is I'll I'll just draw um, on top of uh, just a quick diagram to explain what I think is this is my uh, terrible mock up of what you can see on the screen, um, and uh, and uh, it's about where the database lives and whether it's guest checkout or not that's being used in scenarios, and I know this is similar to MCR as well. Um, so I suppose it's just it, it, getting everyone on the same page as to what that kind of means um, in this case. Um, yeah, I think I think I, that would benefit. Obviously, I'm struggling because I'm not seeing the the screen, and um, so I'm relying on on you guys describing what you're currently looking at. But and you, you're aware of this, Nick. From our perspective, when it comes to the website, people will be able to search and find activities. But when it comes to book, they will log into their MCR active account and book via that mechanism so it wouldn't be the guest checkout that you've just described absolutely um yeah okay that's grand <laughs> yeah so I, I think that i think that the slight confusion here is that the, the guest checkout option is actually not necessarily doesn't necessarily look like a guest checkout depending on where you are and so let me let me just explain what that means um so if you're on a uh, a website let's say it's called mcr active um and that website um has a list, a list of uh, opportunities that you can go in and do, um, and um, and there might be kind of search results on that website you can imagine, um, and you could you could pick one of those and, and kind of proceed into finding out about it um, with a kind of book now button or something similar. And so if someone clicks on the book now button, the the if they've already logged into MCR Active, so if there's a login button in the corner of this screen, right, um, where they can um, where they can they can be uh, authenticated with MCR Active's own database, and this is exactly how it would be for um, Westminster as well uh, in the My Westminster account. Then you are a guest to Everyone Active, um, but you're a known user to MCR. If that makes sense, that's the that's the difference. So there's one world which is you you are a you are logged into MCR, and then you um, you come through as a guest to everyone active because the account lives in MCR. The account doesn't necessarily live in everyone active. Um, and so that's, that's what that is. And then the other world is where, um, uh, where they do actually live in everyone active and, um, or, or GLL. 
So let's so let's um, let's say, for example, that you wanted to take advantage of someone's monthly membership they might already have. Um, in that case, you would do the same thing here, except you wouldn't potentially you would you wouldn't need them to log in, or you could get them to log in if you wanted to. Um, but then what would happen is that box that we just talked about on the other screen, um, which is here, would become available. Uh, apologies, this is quite rough and ready. Uh, so you would you would you would go through the the page to to link to your account, and then at that point you would. Um, you would connect to Everyone Active's existing database. And so I guess that um, you really need a little person clip art here. Um, but the, the, the person uh, would be in one or the other. Um, I guess that's the difference between the two. Um, so does that kind of, does that make sense as I've, I've tried to draw it there a little bit? You might need a bit more explanation. Might I? It, it does from my perspective, Nick, um, but I'm perhaps a bit closer to it than others on the call. Sure. Um, I'm sorry, just to abuse Google's uh, drawing library a minute. Would you um, be expecting the the accounts to be linked in general or just for that one session, if that makes sense? That's a great question. So uh, I'm just going to the identity lives in the top diagram on the left on the bottom on the right so josh um the the question of whether this is a, is a one off or it's a, a ongoing connection is related to whether you allow something called offline access and so it's actually possible here that you might have um you might just let them in for one uh payment or one um session i think this is what um we've talked about in the in the context of westminster uh, for the short-term solution, um, just as a, there's no login button actually on the Active Westminster site initially, so you would just be logging in um, to use the MCR card, and then it would forget your details immediately after you've finished the transaction. Um, and then the other option is that you actually uh, you go through that process and you connect the account between two the two different ones. So um, this is uh, to give you that example. That's the third option here. The actual identity lives in both places in the third option because you've connected the two accounts. And so um, in the option where you're, you're saying, I've got an MCR active account and I also want to, um, there we go. Um, and I also want to connect to my account that I've got in everyone active, um, for example, then this is, this kind of does a linking process of connecting the two together through that same thing. That makes sense. So it's like, um, so the top the top option is I can log in through MCR. Therefore, you know who I am. Um, this is Jane Smith. Jane Smith's details are used as guest for Everyone Active. So Everyone Active doesn't know that person, but MCR does. Option two, MCR, it's not a login, or Active Westminster, it's not a login. So Active Westminster doesn't know the person for for phase one. Um, so you. You log, you you authenticate through this thing, and then you can get access to the person that's already in Everyone Active. So you're logging in as the Everyone Active person, and then and then on the third option is MCR uh, and potentially Westminster Future option, which is where you've got um, the identity lives in MCR or Westminster. You've already got a login or change for life. You've already got a login, and actually what you want to do is connect that account to another login that you already have in in Everyone Active. Um, so you're connecting the two accounts and then you can continue to make bookings um, through that account uh, as a member. Someone's about to say something. Okay. Yeah, I'm just saying one of the challenges we've got with this, particularly with that top scenario where the member exists, they've got a, a record in the MCR Active database, for example, but don't yet exist as a record in the Everyone Active. Um, potentially all the things that give them preferential pricing um are dependent on that person having a record in the in the plus two side of things with the right subscriptions the right price levels whatever else it may be mm -hmm. um so it's gonna be quite difficult to if that record doesn't exist kind of yeah we've we've logged in from the msr active point of view we've recognized you have account as mcr active with them pushing them through as a guest um 
it's that control of well presumably there's probably some preferential pricing that they're expected to get on account of having a an existing account as an MCR active person but they're not necessarily going to get those um, preferential pricing um, or those benefits when they just go through as a guest and the logic around that potentially isn't going to be a straightforward oh we'll just give them a price level because it's yeah it could be involved sort of combinations of subscriptions are they inactive what's the date what's the time advanced booking periods and lots of things that those kind of benefits can be quite complicated so if i can just jump in on that there with regards to I, if i'm following the, the conversation correctly the, the we're, we're talking about if there's a monthly membership um or monthly members as part of everyone active and they want to use the MCR active membership portal to say book a squash course that they're entitled to they will always have an existing account over in everyone active if they are a paying monthly member there, there, there'll be no there'll be no way for them to ever sign up as a monthly member without them having an account over in everyone active what i've asked david to ensure then is that the link that the accounts are then linked so that they can book any kind of, as you said, uh, discounts or free options available with their um, membership. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, that's yeah, that's that's exactly right. So it's it's it, that you're talking about the, what we can see on our screen as as option three, where on the right hand side you've got a monthly member um, who is uh, being kind of linked and has all their discounts um, available um, and. Um, and you're linking that to whatever's in the MCR, uh, the MCR account. So you're, you're linking your monthly membership to your um, login, basically. Yeah. That's so right. I'm, I'm not too sure where, where, where the instance would come where an MCR active member would, uh, wouldn't have their account that within everyone active in terms of a paying monthly membership. The only time they may not have an account within everyone active is if they are just a pay-as-you-go member. And then any kind of attributed discounts to that type of membership scheme that we have applied up here in Manchester. That's where we're looking at the potential widget solution for the reception to be able to pull up and see. And I would have thought the widget solution would have facilitated any booking mechanism via that either. Yeah, so to, to, to kind of trans that to translate that from outside, outside MCR uh, land, uh, yes, uh, that, that basically I think what we're saying is that, um, this, and this is back to kind of what your, your point was there, Guy, um, if you're in option 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 one, which is guest mode, um, in terms of uh, Anne-Marie, as you were saying, the pay-as-you-go option for people that don't have an account in Everyone Active but do in MCR, um, those people potentially have two um, routes to go and make a booking. One is as a guest, complete guest, and the other is as a, a card holder or some kind of um, uh, discounting associated with MCR. But the, the challenge we've got is that that discounting because the, the offers published uh, in this direction are open data, can't be too complicated. And so you have a situation where you have to have uh, very limited discount options, you know, 30%, 40%, um, and 100%, for example, well, 100%, 0% off, um, uh, and that's it. And so, and then uh, as long as your MCR, as long as your um, whatever it is on the left-hand side, uh, Active Westminster MCR knows which of those offers to select, and the agreement is in place with everyone active that they're allowed to book those offers and not book other offers, um, then those offers are, are able to be uh, booked as guests. Um, and then the, the decision of which offer to, um, to choose uh, of the 30, 40 or 0% options, for example, sits on the left-hand side of this diagram. That sits with uh, Active Westminster. That sits with MCR Active to determine whether they are uh, um, allowed to have that discount um, because that's where they... Uh, sign up for that membership that's where they, they qualify for um the um whatever whatever process of um uh certification they go through to say yeah you you're you're you do that discount um but that but in the in the other two options when you're using this authorized page you can have very granular pricing specific to your membership type so if you've got like a hundred different types of memberships monthly versions of dating back however long that haven't been you know that are are still there um, you can you can those all apply in option two and three because you've logged in the pricing you'll see at checkout is the pricing related to the person on the right hand side with the account that, that exists um, does that make sense uh, 
That makes sense I to think, me. Uh, but yeah, I, no, I think so. My question is going to be more around how we, as, you, as, you, as you've alluded, there's many different levels of that pricing, many different rules that come with membership, mm. what you can book, when you can book. How are we going to get that across in, in this existing opportunities feed so that we're not showing things that to, to, to guests or people who haven't logged in or people who, for example, have a silver membership, seeing things that only people with a gold membership should have. I get the pricing things a bit easier to figure out because you can do that at the point where you're trying to purchase. But my concern comes around the, the other side of it with all the rules and processes that come in with the, the membership side. Um, I'm not, so, uh, I think one of my concerns, I, I don't think there's anybody else, any of our providers on, on this call today, um, is how we we ensure that th this booking API doesn't allow the bypassing of some of those rules. So if, for example, a member has had their account frozen, they shouldn't be able to come through this process to then mm -hmm. actually use their membership to still get in. So mm -hmm. there's a number of things that I think the granularity that the opportunities feed in this booking API offers, doesn't, it feels that there's, a, there's going to be a lot of complexity that may cause some issues for, for some of our providers. Yeah, so one of the limitations of the proposal as it stands is that you're, you're totally right, that there, isn't, there, there is information about membership specific access, uh, that as you say, you, you may want to have gold, silver, bronze, however many tiers of stuff. Um, the assumption this makes is that um, all the opportunities are either um, you need to log in to access this opportunity or you can book it as a guest but it doesn't give you the granularity to know whether you when you finish logging in through that um sign-in process whether you actually get access to it um if you sort of mean it's you you get to the page and it says you can't do this as a guest you need to log in you then try and log in of course your actual membership doesn't allow that because we don't know who that person is until they have logged in um so there's no way until they identify themselves there's no way to know if they qualify, I suppose. Would that give a, a poor user experience? If you, you're getting shown an opportunity and then it's not until you get to the point of trying to actually get the opportunity that you're told you need to be to log in. So now you have to have created your membership elsewhere to then log in to only be told, actually, you can't do it. But if I've already got a membership, I probably would have found that out myself by going direct to my provider. I'm, I'm, for me, I'm, with this, I'm struggling a little bit with the use case, and because my understanding of it is, is our providers, the ones I spoke to, would only expose via the ODI the things that they're struggling to to fill, that's they're struggling to fill, so they're trying to fill the gaps. If they've got members, they've, they've probably been using other avenues to get those members to fill those gaps. Um, I, I, can't see, I can't see what they, I can't see what you'd expose through this. You either have to expose everything on the off chance you've got a member or only expose the things you want to expose, but then your member's not getting that full experience. They, they, they've got a disjointed experience where they'd see everything they could get through their full membership in their, for lack of a better word, their native membership app. And then through these third party providers, yes, they'll get access to some of the stuff, but from a membership point of view, they're getting a disjointed experience because they might be able to get access to all the basketball courts three months from now but when they come into this experience they can only see the ones that i've been off offered by the provider through the odi feed and I, I think it's it feels like we might end up with the disjointed experience especially my expectation would be if i'm linking my account i'll get to see the bookings that i make not only through this third party app but natively and vice versa i'd expect the same communication method i think it feels that there's to be quite a disjointed experience and it, it might lead to unhappy users. That, that's, what, that's one of my concerns. Um, I've also got some other questions around the contractual obligation um, here. If, if I, as a member, take a course through M, what's the MCA Active that I would have got normally as part of my membership, what's, and if, if for example, if everyone active and MCA Active, it's a, the broker relationship is a reseller, actually i would have got this for free anyway or as part of my membership is mca active still a reseller what, what i 
do, do they have a dual brokership uh, identity? There's some things like that, that from the business operational side that I've got questions about. That, um, I would expect some of our providers to be asking at this stage. Yeah, oh, that's a lot to take on there. That's that's really good. No, no, that's really good. Maybe in in reverse order, um, this would be definitely agent broker, not reseller, because there's no there's there's no way you can what what this is doing is facilitating uh, existing relationship between two parties. So the, the well between the yeah between the, the the customer on the left hand side and the um, provider on the right hand side. So there the, the, this wouldn't be compatible with the reseller option where you kind of buy it and then sell it on because that that it's a personal contract that you're. Uh, booking within um, so that, that that's a fairly straightforward one in terms of contract um, actually for the question on use case that's probably not best for me to answer but maybe some of the people on the call that proposed this uh, as to why this is a useful thing uh, to be able to do so why would we want people to basically what's the retention versus the uh, as a theme I saw in some of those emails but what's the retention uh, versus the just the new people uh, argument here because I can see what Wayne's saying retention people just use existing apps um, one argument is that actually everyone who, everyone who has got a membership should just use the GLL app or the Everyone Active app. Why would they go through other apps uh, to do that? Um, and so I don't know if anyone here has wants to kind of explain why from their, maybe the app's perspective or from apps that are our perspective, um, it would be useful to be able to book using the membership that exists. And, and that's, a, that's a useful thing for you and not just a guest. Can I maybe jump in on this just to maybe give a bit of context with, with, with up here in Manchester and MCR Active's perspective on this? Um, up here in Manchester, obviously, we've got two ledger operators. We've got um, DLL and Everyone Active, Legend Gladstone. But from um, a, a city's perspective, the, it's, was there are ledger operators from our residents um, looking inwards, it's MCR Active is their member. So when you go to one of our ledger centres here, you don't sign up uh, per se as a better member or than everyone active member it's um an mcr active member and there's different types of memberships associated to that you can be a pay and play uh or obviously a monthly gym and swim membership but from a residence they are an mcr active member so the reason that we would need to have and moving forward once we launch our solution so in march of next year everyone who is an mcr active member pay and play will sign up via the mcr active website they will not sign up as it currently stands by a better and um everyone active website what we're trying to get to a point of is we obviously are not going to regulate the, the monthly membership schemes we understand that um commerciality wise that's very important to our ledger operators so we're not going to touch that in the respect of um getting everyone to sign up via the mcr active website and process direct debits in that way what we're trying to get is to ensure that the user journey from a residence perspective is is as as easy and non complicated. So if I if I walk into East Manchester Academy and I sign up to MCR Active member and I want to be a gym and swim, I will sign up. I will get an MCR Active branded membership card. Um obviously I will be aware that the operator is better and that's what I would see in my direct debit. I would then assume, as part of that mechanism, I will be told about the wider membership offer of MCR Active, which is not just to our um, within our leisure facilities, but it's community-based. There's um, there's discounts associated across the community, and um, as well as our events and stuff like that. I'll be told about that and asked to um, extend my membership. Now, if my uh, accounts aren't linked, then the user journey is totally disjointed in that because. From my perspective, I'm an MCR Active member. I've I've gone and increased my membership to the full membership. So when I sign into MCR Active membership to facilitate that, because we're going to have it where you can link to wearable technology and a whole host of other offers that our ledger operator membership schemes don't facilitate, I would definitely want to be able to book my squash court via that, not have to sign back out of MCR Active and go to the better website and sign in via that to be able to access it. So it, I see the question the other way around as to why they wouldn't be linked because that would that would create a very poor user journey from our from here in Manchester and I and I get I think Nick I've, I've discussed with you before it's kind of that compromise of what we're trying to achieve up here within our city as well as obviously complementing the booking standards. That's, that's really helpful, that Marie. Sense? Yeah, that's that, that's really great. Does it, does anyone else want to on the on the brokers? I think yeah. the use case is really important to kind of get surfaced here. Yeah. Uh, so 
just from a Westminster point of view as well, I sort of agree with what MCR actor was saying. I think there's, there's much bigger picture here um, in terms of looking just beyond the leisure sector with this. Um, this isn't just about people that have got existing memberships. That's, that's part of it. Um, but also it's around how we get people into a wider ecosystem that is as adopted open active. So for instance, in Westminster, what we're doing, the first step of the process is around getting um, our leisure centers open. Um, but we've got other providers, whether that's community use agreements or partner sites, which use um, different system to, um, they don't use Gladstone, so they use things like Legend, um, or, and also our smaller clubs and providers, which use uh, open data platforms like Book Wango, Team Up, et cetera. Um, so this is around all of those individuals coming into a, a, a system. Now, from our point of view, we're not really fussed around where they go, as long as they can go somewhere, find it, book it and if necessary pay for it um in, in a single sort of uh, customer journey um so our active westminster website is designed to do that we've got a curated feed which will bring in all of the open data um providers that we're happy with and that we've vetted and this is all coming through obviously a big part of that is going to be um everyone active and those that are that, that have got an everyone active membership or those that are entitled to uh, active Westminster card discounts in Westminster should be able to freely access those. Um, <clears throat> and that doesn't just apply to everyone active sites, that applies to all of our clubs and providers, our partner sites, our CUA sites, and the other bits um, with it. So there is the bit around those that have got in additional sort of memberships. So there needs to be that two way flow or connection between whoever the provider is, whether that's everyone active or whether that's um, a standalone club or provider, there needs to be some sort of transaction with that. Um, and the position that we'd like to get to is that once you log in via your My Westminster account, the price that you are showing is the price that is applicable to you. So if I'm a, uh, a, an older resident in Westminster, I should get my 40% discount applied and that's the fees and charges that should display on screen. If I'm checking out as a guest, obviously I won't get those. Um, uh, as part of that 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 process um so for me that's around it's it's the whole holistic journey i appreciate there's a lot of complex um, complexities to deal with within that reason why we, we shouldn't be moving towards that around the connectivity between the front end and the back end or whoever you know the back end of what what we come through um but from a customer journey point of view what what we don't want is an individual going on to um, the Everyone Active app and being quoted one price and coming onto our platform and being quoted a completely different price. It should be seamless, it should be the same. Um, and that's that's where, where we need to get to. With, from our point of view, if people book via the native app, it doesn't really matter to us. If they book via the na native website, it doesn't really matter to us. What matters to us is, can they find it? Can they book it? And if they need to pay for it, and when they are asked to pay for it, are they being provided with the right information at the right time? Brilliant. Um, thanks, Eugene. That's, that's and, really helpful. And that's exactly, literally, I think Westminster and, and Manchester are on the same pages from, from listening in terms of that kind of user journey and what, what our expectation is for our residents to be able to find and book activity across the city. And I think it's key what you pointed out. This has to be an under, um, understood that it is not just for our leisure centres and our leisure operators. I think it's about bringing those together in terms of our community offer and our visitor center offer. Yeah, it makes um, a lot of sense. Does anybody, sorry, yeah, great, Jamie. Does anyone outside yeah. of the uh, the big offer, the big um, councils want to have a two sure. minutes? Yeah. So, so I have a slightly different perspective on this um, and fully agree with uh, active efforts and MCRs, but as Playfinder operates, we're really a discovery portal for people that don't know about venues already. So we're not really interested in getting existing members to book through our platform. Something that was um, mentioned earlier in the call was about the ability to uh, sign up to a membership. And I think the way we're looking at our future is just being able to complement the business models of the operators that we work with as much as possible. Uh, and I think that's um, in part to encourage memberships, the upselling of memberships. Uh, so the way we see our customer journey and life cycle is, you know, introduce someone to a, uh, a ledger center, 
um, uh, or kind of group within that area, and then be able to upsell the memberships. Um, and then possibly if they want to come back and book still by a play finder, but with their new everyone active or GLL or fusion membership membership, they can do that. Um, and so possibly in the future, it could be that um, people that have signed up through PayFinder can still book via PayFinder. Um, but we've spoken with operators about the ability to um, be an affiliate to both memberships as well as the pay as you pay. Uh, and that is something that we're really interested in doing. Um, so uh, in terms of where I hope this uh, kind of feature to possibly expect, extend to, it's being able to sign up as well as to um, log in with the membership. Brilliant. Um, just just on that, yeah. sorry, just now on that next, that is obviously an, a key agenda for MCR Active because it's in our interest to drive the fall into our leisure operator centers. So as part of when you sign up to MCR Active, this isn't about um, current members per se. What we want to ensure is that current members of our leisure centers have seamless journey via the MCR Active website. But when you sign up to MCR Active, you will be given the option, would you like to become a member of your local gym? We will be encouraging people to increase their membership via the leisure centers. So it's also about driving new memberships into the facilities as well and having reached to residents here in Manchester that our ledger operators wouldn't normally have. I think, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I hear what you guys are saying about this is kind of the third thing that Rupert was talking about, like kind of giving people a signpost into upsell to membership. Um, and I guess there's a, there's a, this sounds like a, it's a great topic and there's definitely a good conversation to have about that. It probably looks like just from just looking at what we know so far, but it may not look like this. It, it's probably a, a kind of, uh, a journey a bit like you kind of uh, get, if you go on to comparethemarket.com, you get sent off to another website and then you go through the journey of their website to do the joining journey. It, I, unless we get into the kind of aggregating direct debit world, which is probably not where people are thinking, um, it's probably more about, you know, making sure that there's a referral, you know, click through. And then when you, you know that if you've gone through Playfinder or you've gone through MCR and you've, um, you've decided you want a membership, that a GLL is aware of that yeah. so that they can kind of count that towards their, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good, uh, sorry. yeah. Yeah. Well, we're discussing that, with our key operators. Oh. Sorry guys. Uh, sorry, Eugene, do you want to go first and then now Marie? Yeah. Yeah. So, so just, just from our point of view, this, for me, this isn't the primary purpose of open data. This isn't about upselling. Um, that's part of it. The primary focus of this is to get the information to that don't currently have it or those that aren't currently active to get them active and then once we get them active it's around keeping them active so that's when the upsell comes in it comes in much later down the line in terms of what we're doing here and we're still quite narrowly focused on the leisure sector here as opposed to the physical activity leisure and sports sector it's much broader than that so for us we're primarily using this to get the information more freely available for people to find it and to book it and when necessary pay for it um, the upsell comes way, way down the line in terms of that, because primarily for us anyway, we want to use open data to change behavior. Um, yes, it will help keep those that are already active and keep them active. Um, that, that's, that's what we've always been good at as a sector. But what primarily for me, what open data is, is, is primarily about is reaching those that currently don't have the information or find it difficult to find or difficult to utilize or navigate and making that far simpler and far easier from a transactional point of view and a customer journey point of view. I think if we, if we keep focusing on what we already do, I don't think we're going to get any significant benefit from, from this. Yes, it will make some people's lives easier, but not the people that we actually want to reach. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Can I just uh, give a use case to to add to this? It's Rupert from Playways here. Um, so um, uh, we're running a project for Badminton England, and one of their um, uh, objectives is to increase their um, uh, participation on in no strings badminton sessions. And part and parcel of that is a new social membership product that um, gives people a discount on on no string sessions so th so the journey there would be 
using open data to, to, to promote no string sessions, uh, to get new people in. So this is one of the reasons I, I, I raised the point about uh, you know, signing and registration. Uh, we don't have the concept of a, of a sort of guest guest access so you know you would go through the booking process and as a, as a first time visitor a first time badminton player let's say in the no strings environment you would um, uh, register an account and you would you would pay the higher price we have tiered pricing uh, in playways so you can say if you're a if you're a social member it's eight pounds and if if you're not it's 12 pounds um, so initially you would pay your Twelve pounds and arrive in the system, and then in that system, right next to where your session is, would be a big tile that would say, "Would you like to buy social membership?" And once you bought that social membership, the idea is it would encourage that person to continue playing more no strings badminton. So that, that's just a sample use case. Um, talking of membership as well, we also have an eligibility system in Playways. Uh, it's quite complex. Uh, customers can set it up any way they like. You can say you can't come into this session if you're under 18 and you don't have a membership. Uh, what we're doing on our end when people publish open data is we're saying that if you, if you set eligibility rules about coming into a session, um, it won't publish to open data. So if you're publishing to open data from Playways, what we're saying is, is that you need, you need to make it open, i.e. there is no point where somebody can get to that booking process and it, it puts a big hand in front of you and says you can't come in. Uh, the only thing you will get is that tiered pricing. But that's our user journey, um, and this is something that we're very keen on in Playways. It's about bringing people in through open data and, and, then, and then promoting that further participation through the easy purchase of, of memberships, which would lead to discounted prices in the future. That's, that's great. Really, that's our use case. <laughs> God, it's good. We've got a lot, we've got a lot of use cases. I should, I should, I should clarify, um, uh, Rupert, for our discussions, just in terms of the terminology. So we, we are talking about still Playways is using... Uh, guest checkout in order to uh, for the people to have that seamless booking journey because that's the kind of core of the spec um, but you're talking about additional um, yeah uh, that's aren't you? The, yeah the, the guest checkout so if it so it all depends on what what's on the other end so on your right hand side of your diagram here so it, it you know in uh, say let's say it's the active Westminster implementation that may well be everyone active um, yeah, I guess it could be a, a no strings badminton England session and it could be a playways session so uh, a Westminster mark community has set up and they want to publish open data to active Westminster's activity finder so they can do that through um, through the playways platform um, on the Playways end, to be in a session, to book onto a session, you have to have a, a registered account on Playways. You, you can't exist just as a, a floating sort of passive or guest user in Playways. So that, that, that's a point of interest for me, and which is why I raised it uh, in, in the early part of this poll. As, uh, you know, as to, you know, you've got guest or sign in. In our world, it's kind of sign in or register. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think, okay. Yes. I think that's, we did, we did talk about there being a guest option in Playways before, but maybe that was something else. So you, you caught, you had a name for it, um, but uh, maybe that's yeah, a separate. I think I know to. what you're alluding to. Yeah. It's, um, I think we call, we, we call them passive, passive. Yeah, players, that's right. Yeah, there, yeah. There, there is that option, but it, it's, it's not a, in order to achieve, you know, the objectives that we're looking at in terms of furthering participation, having, those passive accounts brought into the system it sort of in a way it kind of it, it's the end of a journey um you know we, we there is a, a fuller journey for a participant and indeed for some for an organizer um a sports manager uh, going forward we want to you know we want people to come into let's say it's the no strings badminton world and what we want to do is to is to encourage them to keep coming back so uh, yeah. I understand the, the premise of open data and it's about, you know, really what we're, fo what we're focusing on there is getting potentially inactive people active. Uh, but then the next big, big step is keeping those people active. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, great. So um, sounds like, yeah, so you, yeah, so there's a, there's a, the first time people go and book, you want to make that journey as seamless as possible. And then, and then on the subsequent attempts, um, if they've already, if they've got a membership, if you can upsell them a membership or if there's some kind of connection in there, um, that gives them that ability, then this is about 
helping them to, to utilize that. Um, I, Wayne, uh, I know we kind of did a big circle there about use cases, but I'm concerned we did, everyone's done a good pitch. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Because that was kind of where it started from. I, I, I can get what the objective is. I, I can get that. I think what I'm looking at is not what's now, what's next, what's going to fall, what, what, what's this leading us to? Because it, what it feels like is this is this next step and the next step for this will be moving towards a, an amalgamation of my view of my activities. So if I've got um, a membership with three clubs and I'm using MCA Active, I'm going to be expecting in MCA Active to see the amalgamated view of my three memberships. And I feel it's starting to stray into a, an area that's outside of that original opportunities booking, filling the, fill the spaces. And I get it for agent broker only. Okay, that makes it a bit simpler. But it feels as though there's a number of complexities that are going to start to grow into this as people go, well, now I want to be able to do this. Now I want to be able to do that. I mean, in, even in this conversation already, we've now start, started talking about joining up via this and creating a membership via this. And it feels as though there's lots of things that we're trying to push through it, I guess, in my view, is it's a high volume feed of information that are very specific things that you would ordinarily have just used an existing providers, uh, software providers, API to handle that information. You know, give me your membership details, give me this, give me that. It feels as though this aspect is starting to draw towards it. Well, to save me development as a, a third party, I want you, the ODI, to make all the providers have a standardized API approach. I know that's that's just me just trying to get to the point straight away, not trying to be controversial, I think. I'm just trying to say, it feels as though my concern is that's where we're going. Mm. And I don't know if that's in keeping with maybe even what we, we had expected. Yeah, it's a, really, it's a really good question. It's, it's, it sounds like there's a, there's a question about, is this just enabling retention or is it doing a lot more? Are we going to end up in a situation where you're going to want to be able to join up and do all the things that you can do as a, you know, as a member within uh, the online booking platforms that exist at the moment um, through the third party websites? And is that desirable actually? Is that what we're trying to do? Um, I mean, that's certainly a slightly the impression on you. Sorry, go on, Marie. Sorry. I think it was, it, it, from, from our perspective, whilst we, we definitely support um, Opportunity Data being open and the booking standards what we're trying to achieve up in manchester is something that we wrote, wrote into our contracts with our leisure operators in terms of the mcr active membership and it just happens to complement all of the work that the odi are doing but and, and as nick is fully aware of that and um, the the conversations i'm having with dll everyone active and subsequently gladstone and legend it to make the membership work here in manchester and it's just a big bonus if we can help contribute to the ODI and open actives agendas around the booking standard and the opportunity data because they obviously tie in very close together but we are certainly looking to kind of piggyback on the work there's a contractual obligation to our ledger operators to make the MCR active membership scheme work and they've been abreast of what that membership would look like from them so from Manchester City Council's perspective there's a bit of, if, if, if nothing happens nationally other than it's it facilitated here, they'd be all right with that. Whereas obviously with our um, close links to Sport England, we want to see the, the whole leisure industry um, benefit from the work that we're doing here. But I kind of feel like maybe the, there's been miscommunication into who's kind of trying to force some things through on the back of others, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, I don't think there's, a, the, um, there's uh, anyone kind of saying some, someone's forcing something through. This is more a question of, I guess, is this in scope for the initiative uh, as, as the proposal yeah. is, is, is being discussed here? Is this something that we think as a group um, uh, is, is something that Open Active should be doing and should be helping with? Um, is this part of the journey um, when, you've, when, when you've already got an account, basically, um, and helping people to book with that account? Is that something that we think um, Open Active Yeah, should? I think it's future-proofing the direction that it's going because if, if, if it sounds like Westminster ourselves are starting to implement these types of user journey for our residents here 
that it, it, it makes sense for Gladstone and Legend to use something like the, the open active agenda to future-proof work that they're doing now with each of their, I know they're, we're not their direct customers, but our ledger operators are. Sure. Um, Guy, did you have a, a, a point before that, just to go back to you? Yeah, I think it's just, there's, as I said, it's this, this what is the scope of the open bookings bit. And we were looking at that, you know, we spoke up those two user journeys. There's, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just a guest. And I'm going to go through and book as that. I'm an existing account holder. I want to go and, and book through that. And then there's this registration one that, okay, you know, the amount of work that has gone into trying to standardize this specification for the booking side of things. If you start trying to standardize that registration process, you've almost got to standardize the whole way in which memberships are managed, which to, to enable that registration through one standardized API, because you've got to register with the right ways to get the right membership subscriptions or whatever else is in Legends world or whatever else is in XN Leisure's world. And that's, Again, we're talking about scoping. It's kind of like, okay, there's a user journey there, but there's a point at which you go, okay, you know, we're developing APIs. Legends have got APIs. Uh, you know, there are APIs that can give this, you know, from a user perspective, you can have this user journey where you, you go on and you do that. But those APIs are specific to that underlying operating system and trying to standardize those is a huge job. Um, you know, standardizing the bookings is, is a huge job from, you know, from Legends' point of view, from our point of view, this has taken a lot of development effort. And yeah, it's kind of like, that registration just sounds a bit more kind of going, leave that, leave that to the APIs of that underlying leisure management system. And, and it's, it's a bit different to, yeah, if you're registering for a Gladstone system, if you're registering for an XN system, then use their APIs in that area. Don't try and, or don't expect those to be part of a standardized package in the way that the booking so, is. I think that's I, where I, that scope starts to get a bit yes. beyond itself. Totally. For, Guy, for what it's worth, I, I, um, I completely agree in terms of um, when we were talking before about that third option, when I kind of said it would probably most likely be a link off, I guess what I meant there was a link to the join site of Gladstone or, you know, it's not there's no, there's no automated API magic. It's literally just where's the, where, where should I send somebody so they can upgrade to a 20 pounds a month membership? It's that web page, um, and and that's kind of it. It doesn't have any more, um, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I completely agree. And uh, well, I don't know how, what everyone else thinks, but certainly, um, I think it, it, yeah, the complexity we've seen of membership is. I think this is the grey area we're talking about today. This is the bit where you're using someone's existing membership to book, um, which is not about creating that membership for them. It's not about managing direct debits for them or any of that stuff, which is, is a whole other world of uh, stuff that even, I know even um, the MCR and um, and uh, Westminster projects aren't going into. Uh, there's no intention there to uh, manage that side of um, kind of things on behalf of the operator because ultimately that, you know, the operators, that's kind of what they, you know, there's, there's functions of operators and that's one of them. So um, not, not trying to take that away. Um, is that, is, that, is, that, is that resonating with what everyone else is, is thinking as well, just to be clear on the scope of this? We're not talking about um, making this a full join uh, API within uh, Change for Life or something. Uh, Nick, could I, could I just add from a, a Westminster perspective, I'd, I'd, I'd agree, you know, that we, we're not trying to expand the scope here, um, you know, to include, you know, a list, a list of all our bookings from multiple providers, for example. Um, and certainly not behind a, an account because, you know, the driver for the, uh, you yeah, know, the reason we're implementing the My Westminster account for this is to to issue an active Westminster card. You need to prove that, for example, that you're a resident of Westminster. And we can link that through our accounts to council tax records, for example, because th there will there'll also be links online. Um, that That's the, one of the big rationales about getting the, the, the link to the My Westminster account. By doing that, you then receive the right entitlements and the right discounts. Um, I mean, if you look at GDS guidance, for example, they, they recommend not using an account, an account wherever possible. If you can use a reference number and process your transaction on, online that way, then that's the recommended way of doing it. So we don't want to go down the route of then building out a, a bit behind the scenes to say, oh yeah, here's a list of everything. So it, the, the rationale behind it is about making sure that you are a resident and you're getting the right, yeah, the right, right price being presented, I think, and, and that's the mechanism to do it, but it doesn't really go beyond that scope.
That's great. So it's, I mean, just to, so kind of summarizing, I think where we think we are, it's, it's there's, there's a, there's a narrow scope here. That's um, not guest checkout because that's being covered in detail of the existing spec and that's core to what everyone's already implementing and working on. And it's not full membership join uh, uh, flow as exists in other systems currently. And that membership join flow is very custom and this bespoke and involves direct debit payments and all that kind of stuff. So, um, this proposal here is neither of those things. This is about allowing people who have already got um, a membership or, or recognized credentials with a provider to allow them to make a single booking with that provider um, and to link their account so they can make further bookings uh, with that provider under that same account. Um, but there's no expectation that, um, I think to what you were saying, Wayne, about where would the things show up? Um, this is very much a, the, the booking is being made through that third party into the, the existing account that's in whatever system. Um, so it's not, I, I, I would imagine there's no, well, there's certainly nothing in the proposal currently about feeding the information back the other way. So you wouldn't expect MCR Active to suddenly have all the bookings you've ever made in GLL uh, to, to be there. This is just allowing the one way flow. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel like, I, feel, I was expecting actually that another kind of use case that we haven't really had, um, and I'll, maybe if I say it, so if anyone has that, and maybe it's just not, there's no one on the call to represent it, but the kind of use case where you're talking about using a, another medium uh, to, to make a booking that, you know, maybe you would already know, know how to do. So um, my favorite example is Alexa, but, you know, that's just because it's, it's, it's a fun thing to talk about. Um, but, you know, using Alexa to make a booking with your existing GLL account, for example, enabled by an Alexa app that lets you book a bunch of other things as well at the same time. Um, that's a situation where maybe you don't want to use a medium that's being, uh, that's available to, to make those bookings, but you do want to be able to do something uh, using whatever app you're in. Maybe um, another example is if you've got some kind of motivational or tracking app that's persuading you to go in and book things and do things that maybe you book through that motivational experience so that you're, you're using, using your gym membership, but actually this is just triggering you to book and there's no expectation within that stop smoking app or whatever it is that you um, would be uh, seeing everything you're booking. It's not trying to replicate the whole experience of uh, you know, the operator's portal. It's just things that you book through there are in there because that's where you book them. Um, and those that you've used a membership to book, you've got that price. And those that you haven't, you've gone through the guest route, you've got that. Um, but it's about that kind of, um, the, the, the experience is more tailored to the motivation rather than just trying to replicate what GLL already has on a different website. If you see what I mean, that, that, I don't know if anyone's, has anyone got those, one of those examples to, to talk through uh, here or is that just, <laughs> I can do that otherwise. Not on the call. Okay. Um, sorry, look, we are looking into um, uh, kind of voice searches and voice activations, but we're not, um, I don't think that would apply to us because um, uh, for the reason I mentioned when I was saying how we're acting as a discovery portal. Sure. Um, I think, yeah, was it, was it Juice or someone, one of them said that that was, anyway. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, so given we so we've got the scope it seems like it meets some of the needs of those on the call um and potentially some of those that aren't on the call but we need to get that clarified in terms of what those user journeys actually are um so i suppose i suppose are we are we comfortable with this as i kind of just described there which is not kind of it's the halfway so you don't get everything that you've ever booked in gll coming through you just get the things you book through your mcr portal or whatever it is uh, stop smoking app um, coming through um, as a as a halfway. Does that does that feel like a reasonable proposal, or do we are we still thinking that that's probably out of scope? I'm just trying to get a sense of like, does that seem reasonable? Does that seem useful to people? Just from my point of view, I, th I think it should be in, <coughs> in scope. I think um, if we don't do it at this stage, it's, it's only going to come at a later stage anyway. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's worth doing this this point. And it sounds like a lot of people are minded to do that anyway, or it's, it's a desired sort of outcome at some point. So um, I think that it's something we should be putting in scope at this stage. That bringing back. Oh, yeah, I've got a 
Oops, sorry. Yeah, I was trying to unmute. It's, sorry. Go on, Marie. You, you, go, you go and, and wait <laughs> after. I was trying to unmute, so I was, uh, and it, was, it just wouldn't let me. Um, from our perspective, we want our residents to be able to have a clear understanding of, of what activity they are doing with us. So we would, if they're booking or attending anything within our leisure centres, that should be showing up on their membership with us. I don't know if I've gotten myself confused, but what wasn't being included in scope there potentially. Right, okay, so if at MCI you'd, want, you'd even want to go as far as if someone's booked through GLL's website directly, that information to propagate back to MCR? If they're, if they're an MCR active member, which they, the only chance that they won't have a full MCR active membership is if they sign up via the GLL website directly for the pay monthly membership and then haven't completed the journey to extend to the wider MCR active membership. That would be the only reason we would not have their details set over in the MCR Active. Yeah, the details of the, right, the, the, the thing they're booking. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Well, um, I, but we 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 will. They just won't be on the same view because obviously we get that that was they signed up by a DLL. That, that data is our way the data owner of it. So we will see that in a different mechanism. But what we're having is that our residents don't have multiple accounts that across the city, especially when we directly. Are responsible for those uh, opportunities so sure. that they would have a clear picture of all of their participation. So, so to paraphrase that then it might be that you could get that information through other means that aren't aren't in the standard um, but the, yeah, the reason that can be yeah that can be obviously between us and, and everyone active in, and, and DLL to facilitate right in okay. terms of for our solution that we're building up here and it might be the same for Westminster I'm not too sure. Okay, that's helpful. Sorry, um, Wayne, did you want to say something? I realise we keep cutting each other off. It's, uh, it's all right. Go on, Wayne. I can't remember now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It was... I was myself by making a note. No, I forgot. <laughs> and the note wasn't about what it was. <laughs> what <you're> no. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, okay, well, maybe that will come back. Um, okay, well that sounds good. Okay, so it sounds like we're happy to maybe that stuff might be in agreements out of band anyway. And so it sounds like this is just about facilitating the booking rather than wider data sharing outside of that, because that does definitely sound like a different type of API to the thing that we've got at the moment. It's just as about because the changes as as being proposed here are very minor to the API itself, just to allow this to happen. This isn't a massive change, um, just to allow you to to choose to log in as a existing member or not. Um, but it, whereas uh, full data uh, sharing from both from from all parties would be a, a much bigger um, uh, undertaking and uh, potentially something that as Guy was saying should be in the realms of individual APIs. Um, while, while Wayne's thinking, Guy, did you have any further thoughts on that or are you with, with everything? No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> oh, great. I've remembered now. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Tag team. I think it comes back to uh, one of the questions at the start about the, the process and the applying of rules and the price you see. Um, can we ask, as part of this, some use cases or flows of how we'd expect that to work? At which point you'd expect to see the price I would see as a member versus the price I'd see as a guest? Because as you can imagine, if we're trying to call this API, the audio API, with 1,500 different members all getting 1,500 different prices at that starting point, that's mm -hmm. going to probably kill any system. Yeah. Um, so it's the yeah. point, a uh, clear understanding at the point at which we see that customized members price and the point at which in this, in the flaws that we've had previously in the, in the spec where the membership based rules kick in. So absolutely. So, um, so this would be after the identify stage in the spec, uh, because until you have identify, um, and that's where this 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 green box lives. So for the um, for those who aren't intimately familiar with the um, uh, the spec as it stands, uh, let me just get you the uh, just to explain what it is that we're talking about here. Um, so uh, th there's a um, uh, where are you booking flows. This is that diagram. So there's a there's a flow which this outlines, which is um, here this customer journey, which is select, identify, book and pay. Um, now, the order is important here. Select, identify, book and pay within the scope of the current standard as we as it's described. 
um, it would be, I mean, from an architecture perspective, as Wayne said, um, almost infeasible to give completely customized down to the granular detailed level pricing for every single member that's coming in at the select stage um, without the identify. Um, and that's just because of the, as, as, as Wayne said, the feeds are all designed in that way. Um, you're looking at a totally different architecture, a totally different experience to be able to give that level of customized view um, for, uh, for, for those people to come in. So if, if someone pays, pays 5p less because of some reason, um, then uh, it, yeah, that, that's not the kind of thing that we can do. Um, but from what I understand of the use cases, I don't know if anyone's actually necessarily asking for that at this point. Um, because um, to back to this uh, diagram again, um, the bottom two examples, when you've gone through and you've selected the thing you want to book, you will see the reduced pricing uh, when you get to the checkout screen and you go and, and continue that journey. Um, uh, at that stage, when you, when you check out, you'll see that information. Um, with the first option, as we talked about, if you've only got two or three different discount levels, if it's only 40%, 30% and zero, and it's been rationalized, so you haven't got 3,000, because I'm completely aware that the systems as they stand do allow you to do 3,000 different prices for 3,000 different people. You have a price per person, quite literally, because of the various configurations. Um, but if, if there's a rationalization process that has been gone through and you've only got three prices you know, for every activity, and you've standardized every resident, for example, to one of those three, um, then actually the, 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 the option to include those in the orders feed is a lot more viable and you can do that. And then and even, as we said, book against them as a guest checkout journey, um, as long as you can uh, agree between both parties on either side of the spec, um, who should qualify for each of those uh, offers that are there. If there's a 30% off, obviously the, the broker, the active Westminster needs to agree with everyone active who should qualify for that 30% off in order to, to um, use that price, display it, and then have that through the journey. Um, so, so for the rationalized case, it's very possible to sh surface that information and, and definitely the, the, the simplest flow all the way through to the more complicated flow would support that. Um, for the case where you've got 5,000 prices, um, I, I mean, the, the spec as it stands would, would, it would require a, a very big change, uh, possibly even a different, a whole different spec, in fact, to kind of cater for that because you're talking about live querying of um of information and then displaying that and, and then before you start the journey so it's almost that's a that's a slightly separate um so at the moment what we've got is we've got a feed spec a model spec and a booking spec and the feed spec is about getting the publishing the prices like if you had a if you had a price list on a pdf that's the prices that the, the spec is really about publishing so you've got enough that you can put it on a pdf booklet without like having 15 pages of it um, that's the kind of prices it's publishing it's like the stuff on the website um, and then with the, um, yeah, and then when you go and do the checkout journey, obviously that's allowing you to continue with that information. And if you've got a special um, price of, or something's free for you as a, as a particular membership, then you can, you can guarantee you'll get that right and book as part of your pay monthly membership. Um, I mean, the, the price being correct for the two and three options here is less about, um, it's less about the price being right. It's more about using the monthly membership, I think, is the focus of that. because. Um, if you want to do the prices right, that's going to be a bit of a disconnected journey for the user because they're going to not know the price until they get, click on checkout. So it's probably more about making sure that they're um, making use of the membership and if they expect something to be free, then they'll get to that part of the journey and it'll be free and that'll be very exciting for them. Um, so I guess that's kind of separating those things. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yes, Wayne, that is completely right. And it would be disastrous for us to try and solve that as part of this work. It's a different spec. Um, does that help everyone else in terms of what we're, what we're doing here? And does that, I guess, work for the use cases? I mean, have we got rationalized 20%, you know, 30%, 40% and, and whatever the percentages are, can we, can we put them in, in, on, on one hand or is it really still like 400 for, for Westminster and MCR? More point of view, that should be doable. Um, as per the discussion we've had recently, that, that that's just our own, our own, our own view. Um, people have their own different types of discount schemes and other bits and pieces um, that that are different. But from our point of view, it's it's certainly achievable. Great. So that's the, that's like a rationalised, uh, very very small list. 
um, uh, and Marie. Oh, sorry, so, oh, yeah. so, so Nick, I should, and and you're saying if it's kind of three levels of pricing, that that can be that's achievable within the current standard, is it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cool. That's yeah, right. no, that's good. Thing. But but as Wayne's saying, it's not it's not possible to customize it to every user individually, down to whatever um, thing they might have earned. That's the barrier. Just one question that I asked. Obviously, this in specification can do those different levels of pricing um, through the offers and things. How would it work out which level of pricing, which of those various levels of pricing, which of those three levels of pricing is the right one for the specific member to then go, am I a 30%, am I a 40%, am I a 20%? Because again, a lot of that is then held into the kind of underlying ledger management system when you come to book it's then got whatever logic in place to work out which of those three prices to three prices to apply um but yeah what's the thoughts in terms of i log in i recognize it's me there's a there's a train of thought that goes okay i know who you are but how do i join that up to the appropriate pricing for you yeah, absolutely. So um, the current well, the, what one is suggesting there is that it's actually the that information lives on the left hand side. So MCR Active or Active Westminster would need to know for that individual person that's logged in that they've qualified for that discount, and that's they're the gatekeepers. Um, it's not it's not um, referencing the, the 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 configuration in in the system on the right hand side is obviously much more around the you know more detailed granular five hundred different option structure. Which mm. is is a diff, quite a different, yeah, different thing. But then, if that's the case, is there not the potential for a mismatch in those logics, whereby at the front end we go, okay, we think based on who you are, you get a twenty percent discount. We give our pricing based on that level. Then you go through to make the actual booking. And does that then have additional logic in it that goes, oh, actually? we've recognized you having a 30% discount when it comes to actually make the booking. Yes. So uh, with the, the, with the option one here, it's a, it's a guest. So there is no additional logic that yeah. get, gets run in that. Yeah. It's just basically yeah, from just, that point of view. It's all right. It's more the, the member bit of his known person oh, looking through. Sorry. You're right. So they're, they're, they're different. So yes. So in, in an option one as a guest. Yeah, um, that's fine. Cause it's just a, there's no additional logic. It's just, you tell us this is the, this right. is the level at which they're going to be priced and, and that goes through um, it, as part of the booking bit. It's more where you've got a, you're then identifying a specific person who exists as an account in that underlying ledger management system um, to make sure the logic on the front end matches with the logic on the back end that actually is going to do the booking, work out the final pricing. Yeah. Um, and I guess some of that possibly comes through with the kind of order quote process and that stage process of, working out exactly what it is but there's still a potential mismatch of the price you present at stage whatever stage to a later point yes well i think this is back to the point of if you're using um to, if you're using the second two options here to do pricing it's going to be an inconsistent user journey mm. because the user is going to get one price the headline price when they hit the website and potentially some of the concession pricing from the first option if you know it's 30 percent and the 40 percent options are available um, they might be there too, but then if they if some additional logic's applied, uh, as you say in the order quote process, then that will that will change the price at checkout. Um, so they will always get an accurate price because you're asking in in that order quote, as you say, the order quote process. The logic is entirely being applied by the um, the booking system at that point. Um, so it's it's just giving them a price and the prices or prices and they they deal with it. Um, so I guess that's the logic is, yeah, two and three, it's all the booking system and option one, it's all the broker. Yeah. Sorry, Nick, did you say that option three was, uh, um, that there was sort of two options there. So if I took the active Westminster uh, scenario that you know, there'll be a login on the, the, the left hand side and that would validate that that user is um, uh, you know, a, a Westminster resident and they would expect to see pricing um, according to their valid residency um, where there is multiple providers um, injecting 
uh, sessions data, book, uh, facilities data into the, those feeds, and 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 at, at the Westminster residents. Um, uh, discount would apply to all of them. They would they would all have to have a consistent um, data item in their offers, wouldn't they? So to give you an example, if you know if, if data coming from everyone active said active Westminster, uh, active Westminster valid uh, offer is twenty percent discounted, you, we could show that price. Um, uh, on the left hand side there on the active Westminster website and exclude the other prices but if there was another provider that had the offer as named something else uh, but it essentially meant the same thing then it would be inconsistent then I'm just I'm just trying to think about the scenario when there's there's one sort of overarching organization in this case it's Westminster Council with multiple providers providing different pricing tiers that all include a discount for that overarching organization absolutely so I, I guess another way of doing the same thing within the existing spec and option one is all the spec right now that we, we don't need to do any changes to get option one working um if we got option one with the um with the you, you send your four prices across and they're advertised through all the open data that's one way of doing it and those are different offers the other way of doing it is using something called offer overrides, which is in the spec already, um, and uh, kind of for this purpose. So, offer um, uh, offer offer overrides, and so what offer overrides lets you do is simply override the offer as a broker with a different price. Um, and this is something obviously you can only use if you've got permission to do that. It's not something that every uh, broker will necessarily use, um, but it's it's to allow for price variability where prices might change minute by minute if you're doing things like you know last minute sales and things like that as a broker and allowing that kind of stuff to happen so if you wanted to another option here might be using the spec as it stands um, instead of publishing 30 percent 40 percent off uh, offers um, and uh, and getting them back actually you could have the left hand side the broker just applying that discount and and overriding the price with that discount and that that would then be fed through as a as if it was a price that was already set in the system um, and uh, and so you could just do that and then that way you're applying consistently your percentage pricing across the board um, the issue with that of course is it might be easier from a technical perspective but from a provider point of view making sure that you're happy with that obviously you need to be careful with the contracts that the broker is entering into with the providers that everyone's happy with that override and that those things are well checked and um, and it's all it's all happening correctly because that the risk is that if that logic moves to the left hand side of the diagram and the uh, and there's not the sufficient systems in place to do that properly, of course, uh, that you then have the, the wrong price ends up getting charged. Uh, and then there's a question about, you know, whose, whose responsibility is that between the two parties? And that's something that they would need to work out between themselves. So it's very much, that was more, that feature was more designed for a kind of more of the, um, like I said, price variability where there's both parties are kind of aware of that and they're happy with that um, arrangement of who's um, deciding on the final price. Um, I don't know if, that, if, if that's helpful as another option. So where, where the, if there wasn't an offer in the open data uh, item, would it still apply that uh, offer override? So uh, if if, there, no, if you it's, it's, it's an existing offer, yep. So it, it's overriding an existing offer. So you're saying this is the adult price and I'm going to override it with this other price. So it, it fits within the existing kind of whatever framework the booking system is using for categorizing prices, it's just overriding that one with a different number. So if there were six different offers on the same session, how would that work? Well, it's up to the broker to choose which one and apply the prices. That's all. Okay. The spec doesn't give that. Um, it gives you some. Um, guys, I've just noticed the, the time of coming up to our half past, um, and I, I haven't moved us on to the second topic, primarily because I was keen that we at least got to one agreement here on, on what, um, the main issues in the scope uh, this, um, is and um, and so kind of respecting everyone's time um, keen to almost draw this to a close as we are um, but I just would want to invite a final kind of questions on um, I suppose if, if we could just quickly go around um, th those that are here and could you just say if you're um, a, 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 so that we've talked about just to reiterate very clear scoping this is not about full journey and this is not about uh, guest because those things exist um, this thing here that we're talking about is uh, about just allowing people who've already got an existing membership uh, to uh, use that membership 
um, and uh, log in and, and, use, and get the relevant price for that. But we're saying it's not ideally used for, for pricing. It's more to make sure they can use the existing membership that they've got um, because you would use option one for pricing. So could I just quickly go around and just could you could you get uh, ideally one of three options and then make a very short comment if, if more than that. But just um, could you say uh, if, if either uh, um, you think, yes, it's a good idea. Uh, yes, it's a good idea and you want it. Um, or, or no, you, you would you would seek to um, you you need much more further clarification, and you would kind of seek to say we, we need to pause at this stage. There's this is this is kind of scary. Um, so you know, yes, yes, and I'm very keen, or not really sure as the three options. Um, can we just quickly go around and do that, and then I'll and I'll let everyone um, disappear. So, um, Guy, would you mind going first? Put you on the spot there. Ah, thank you. Um, Yes, with, with caution. I think there are bits to iron out. I think principle, yes, but yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, yes, but uh, Jamie. Uh, yes, from us. Uh, I think our use case isn't as um, uh, obvious or great as Active Vestments uh, or MCR Active, um, but I think it's a good idea in, in principle. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Rupert? Uh, yes, indeed. Brilliant. Uh, Eugene? Option two for me, yes, it's required. Um, the only caveat from my side is I think we've used the term membership here quite a lot. So the so Westminster card isn't a membership, it's more of an entitlement around uh, discounts for residents. So it's, it's just around making sure that we understand that because sometimes when we talk about memberships, it could just be people misconstrued as a gym membership, which is part of it. That makes sense, absolutely. And so it's, it's yes and keen, uh, Eugene, you said yes. Uh, and with bells right. and whistles, yeah. Is it what, sorry? With bells and whistles. With bells and whistles, okay, great. Uh, and, and sorry, Rupert, was it, was it just a yes or was it yes and you're keen? Uh, it would be both of those, Nick. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, Johnny, you haven't said very much and I know you've been patiently listening um, behind the scenes here, but which of those two options or three, sorry, three options would you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have been, yeah, just very interested to see where these conversations are going from our side. Uh, yes, I think we'd be interested. Okay, great. Uh, Wang? I'm obviously going to be on, on number three at the stage. I have a lot of questions um, and, and concerns about this is it, tying the membership side into, and all those processes that fall off the back of being a member. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, Dave? Uh, yes and key. Thank you. Great. Uh, Josh? Uh, sorry, I wasn't expecting to contribute. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Rupert. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Just going to say whatever Rupert says. Good, okay. good lad, good lad. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, great. This is, not, this is not a formal vote. Don't worry, we're not going to count them twice. It's just get a sense of where everyone's at at the end of this uh, discussion. Um, Anne-Marie? With the mute button. Uh, it's, uh, an, I don't oh. know what's going on. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with my mutants today. Apologies. Um, obviously, from Manchester's point of view, this is a necessity for our solution up here. So we are a yes. Okay, great. Uh, Nish? Uh, yes, thank you. Great. Okay, fantastic. I think I think that's everybody who's uh, here. And um, so noting there that uh, in summary, uh, both uh, Guy and Wayne, uh, for for good reasons, uh, are uh, um, thinking that maybe this is uh, this, there's a, there's a lot more questions here than maybe answers at this stage. Everyone else is keen uh, that this is uh, is a useful thing uh, to to move forward with, um, uh, except uh, Jamie, who's uh, less interested in it, um, but thinks it, in theory it's a good idea. Um, so is that a fair, does that a fair summary where we are? Yep. Sounds like it. Great. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much guys. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to waiting lists, um, but we will, um, we'll schedule another, uh, call, uh, about this topic, uh, to cover the, the waiting list angle. And it might be a follow up on this. If we've got a bit more of a further kind of thoughts and, and, um, and, and issues kind of covered off. So it might be the case that we follow up separately, Guy and, and Wayne, just in terms of any of kind of outstanding issues to flesh this out in a bit more detail so that you, you guys will be happy with this proposal. Um, and, uh, and then it sounds like, because the devil's really in the detail here and, and we're that happy halfway of not giving ourselves lots of extra work 
um, but also kind of meeting the requirements is, um, but, um, but yeah, aware that we've all got a lot of other things going on at the moment with um, various booking things. So we'll, we'll see uh, how we go with that. Um, and uh, we'll keep you guys posted on the mailing list. So thank you so much everybody for your time. Sorry, we've gone over by five minutes, um, but um, uh, yeah, have a great rest of the afternoon. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Thanks. Bye.